Praise God, and good morning. It's so good to be here with all of you on this uh, wonderful day that the Lord has made. I know it's uh, a little extraordinarily cool compared to what we're used to. We've been a little spoiled here lately with the Indian summer, haven't we? And uh, I, I've really been enjoying it. It's been beautiful. The, we're, we're near our peak for the fall foliage, so get out there and drive along uh, Old Elk Neck Road, and you'll see some beautiful trees all along the way. Uh, I just want to welcome all of you and welcome our virtual viewers as well, um, who will be enjoying the service once it's uploaded to YouTube and Facebook. Um, I'm Pastor Eric, and I just am so blessed to be a part of such a wonderful church, uh, a church that serves and acts out uh, it's love in the community through missions, and I'm so proud of all of you in the midst of all of this uh, that we're dealing with with the pandemic. It's been a difficult time, but you all have just been so gracious and so wonderful to me. So thank you. Thank you. I'm also blessed to have some amazing folks who are helping uh, with leading the worship service today. Uh, just in case you've forgotten their names or faces or having trouble recognizing them with the masks, uh, we've got... Brian Wilmore over here playing on the organ. We've got Kelly Thompson and Darren Peters who will both be providing some special music for us today. You're in for a treat with them. Uh, also, Joe Buckley, I believe, and Roger Robinson. Is that, and is that Mike Foster up there too? Yeah, so, so they're tra they got a trainee up there, Mike. Uh, so, so thanks, Mike, for enduring that, you know, going through that with Joe and, and Roger. Uh, we also, last but not least, have Bethany Buckley as well, who's going to be helping to lead the worship service. So let's uh, be in an attitude of prayer and turn our hearts towards God as we prepare ourselves for worship today in a moment of silence. Good morning. I just have to say it's very exciting to be here with more than five people. <laughs> this is my first time back with Face to Face and it brings me great joy that you all are here and that we have virtual learners as well. So, Look, I called them virtual learners. Can you tell I'm a teacher? <laughs> oh, goodness. Would you now stand for the call to worship, please? <laughs> <laughs> they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said that each one should love the Lord, their God, with all their hearts and with all their souls and with all their minds. Jesus has given us all the key to faithful discipleship. Yet he added something that he had counted as unimportant. Thanks be to Jesus who gives us the total picture of faithful discipleship. Open our hearts, Lord, today that we might truly follow these commandments. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to a time of confession, let us be reminded of this verse in James 4, 8, that says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let us pray. Merciful God, it isn't easy for us to follow the commandments of loving. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God and to love our neighbors. But we have allowed misunderstanding, fear, hatred, and prejudice to cloud our spirits, turning them away from those who need our love. We place a test before you 
asking that you prove your love to us, or we threaten not to believe in you. Please forgive us for this foolishness and stubbornness. Give us the courage to be people who will care for others. Let us dedicate our lives in your service, always aware of your awesome love for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen.
That was beautiful, Darren. Thank you so much. Our epistle lesson this morning is from the First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have, been, we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So de deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Here ends the first reading. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
else have goosebumps? Woo! Awesome. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. And those able, would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, You shall love your, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can this be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So, uh, back a few years ago, uh, when I went before the Board of Ordained Ministry for my three-hour interview, I was intimidated, I was fearful, I was anxious, and to say the least, I was stressed out. You know, this was to determine whether or not I was ready for ordination. It was determine, to determine my future. I had to go before my peers to answer theological and practical questions about my faith and the work of being a pastor. I had to do that orally for three hours. Well, praise be to God, I passed that test. And now I sit on the board, and I'll tell you that it's much more enjoyable from the other side. <laughs> it's much more enjoyable to be asking the questions uh, than to be on the other side of those questions. Uh, in our gospel lesson today, uh, we see that Jesus Christ also had to endure constant questioning from religious leaders. Now, it may have felt as if the Board of Ordained Ministry was trying to trick me and trap me during that interview, but I know that their intentions were pure. Their intentions were good. They were rooting for me. They were praying for me. They wanted the best for me. However, in the case of the religious leaders in the book of Matthew, their intent was to do Jesus harm. They wanted Jesus to fail. They wanted 
to see Jesus go down. And they wished to trap him and to trick him. They wanted him to be rejected by the people or to even have to face uh, criminal charges. They questioned Jesus with false smiles, misleading tones, and sarcastic honorifics. But Jesus handled these questioners soundly, and they oftentimes went away frustrated and shamed because of his answers. In today's lesson, it's really no different. But this is, in fact, the last series of questions that Jesus receives from the religious leaders. This is the climax of their questioning. This is when they give up on questioning Jesus and then turn to more ruthless ways of dealing with him. We know that following this exchange, they move forward with their plan to have him betrayed and to have him killed. This is the kind of evil that Jesus Christ endured while he ministered to the people, while he taught them, while he loved them, while he healed them, while he served them. Yet when confronted with evil, Jesus taught about grace and love and compassion. The love of Jesus Christ was evident all the way up to the very moment that he died on the cross, at the hands of the very people he came to save. One of the last phrases that Jesus spoke while hanging on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness was on his mind, at the forefront of his thinking, even as he was dying. Well, the message of this exchange in our text today between the religious leaders and Jesus, it's vitally important for us to understand and apply Jesus' teaching to our own lives as well. And this is the message that summarizes all of Jesus' teachings. It's the message that summarizes the entire law of God, all the law and the prophets. When asked about the greatest commandment, Jesus answers, it is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and similarly to love your neighbors. You see, the love of God is made known to us in its most perfect form through Jesus Christ. When we look at Jesus Christ and how he lived his life, we see the love of God. You see, Jesus Christ is God who came to be with us. And through Jesus Christ, we can see that God's love is unmerited. It's unconditional. It's unlimited. It's the kind of love that persists despite our sin. One cannot be commanded to have emotional feelings towards someone. So we, so we know that this commandment from Jesus Christ isn't based on feelings in any way whatsoever. It's not based on sentimentality. Instead, it's based on commitment and action. It's based on what we do. You know, we love salt and sugar and fats, don't we? If you look on the shelves at the grocery store, most of the processed foods have a combination of those three ingredients. It's hard to avoid those foods, and we struggle with it because they're so readily available and so palatable. And for better or for worse, it's in our nature to love those foods. And despite how unhealthy they might be, 58% of our calories come from those processed foods. That's how much we love them. We can't control it. We can't control how we feel towards those flavors. We're also naturally attracted to some people. We feel strong emotions towards certain, certain people, and we can't really control that either, can we? But that's not at issue here. God doesn't command us to have feeling for our neighbors. We can't control how we feel towards people oftentimes. But what can we do? 
we can choose how we treat people. You know, we can choose our commitments to one another. We can keep our promises and the covenants that we make. We can treat people well with love and kindness and respect and compassion. See, love in God's eyes is about action and commitment to someone. It's about sacrifice and generosity and service and compassion and kindness. Uh, and those are all expressions of godly love. We can do those things no matter how we feel inside towards someone. Another way to think of it is to consider how we treat people with whom we have emotional attachments. You know, those people who are closest to us, our spouse, our family, our close friends, and our children, you know, we oftentimes give them special treatment, right? We may be more compassionate or forgiving and generous towards our family and our friends, those people that we have a relationship with. Well, Jesus is saying that the greatest commandment is to treat all people as though they are of sacred worth not just those who are nearest and dearest to us. And instead of treating people uh, how you used to treat your bratty brother or sister, you know, treat them as you do your beloved aunt or, or the grandmother that you remember from your childhood. Now, it's also important to note you know, what Jesus means by neighbor when he says to love your neighbor. Now, Jesus has worked really hard He's taught over and over again to the Jewish people that their love should extend beyond their close-knit Jewish communities. Where religion and culture and ethnicity divided people, Jesus sought to bring those very people together in their love of God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 Jesus commands the people to love even their enemies. See, our neighbors aren't just the people who live near to us in our communities, the people that we are in relationship with, the people we are close to. Our neighbors are expanded to all the people of, of this globe. All people are of sacred worth. We know by the parable of the Good Samaritan that the Samaritan was a neighbor to the injured Jewish man. And Samaritans, who were generally despised in Jewish culture, were to be seen as neighbors. If you're a Republican or a Democrat, who should you consider to be your neighbors? Now, is it just those who think like you? American or Christian, who should your neighbors be? Is it just those who uphold your values and your culture? Well, of course, we know that the answer is that our neighbors are the people we oftentimes least expect them to be. The answer is that even our enemies are to be our neighbors. Who are the Samaritans of our day? Who are the people we generally despise or, or see as our enemies? They're the very neighbors we should love. Now, it's also important to note that Jesus responds to the question of the religious leaders with, with two commandments and not, not just one commandment. This shows that these two commandments are not just similar to each other, but if you dive down into the language that Jesus is using here, into the original Greek language, you can, you can see they are, in fact, equal. These are equal uh, Commandments, they're of equal importance. Loving God and loving our neighbors are equal to one another. It's just as important to love our neighbors as it is to love God. The love of others is equated to the love of God in other places in the scriptures. For example, if you look in Matthew chapter 25, you'll see that Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me. And then he also says, whatever you don't do for the least of these, you have failed to do for me. Even how we treat our en enemies, that's what we're doing to Jesus. Even what we don't do for our enemies, that's what we're failing to do for Jesus. 
This makes it very clear to us that loving others, even our enemies, isn't an option. It's, it's a critical commandment. In fact, in the act of loving our neighbors, we are loving God. We are to treat everyone as if they are Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, everyone is Jesus to be treated with love. What would it look like to love your enemy with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What, what would that look like? You know, that, that neighbor you had a quarrel with, what would it look like to love him? That coworker with whom you've had constant disagreements, that friend who betrayed you, that bully who did harm to your child, that person whose politics are opposed to yours. Even these people, they are our neighbors. And the scriptures say, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. I encourage you to identify those people in your life that you are struggling to see as your neighbors. It's, it's difficult work. This is heart work, where we, we have to do work on our hearts. We have to go to the Lord and study the scriptures and be in prayer and uh, seek after God and ask God to help change our hearts. It's, it's hard work. So I encourage you to identify those people in your life that you're struggling to see as your neighbors and that you think of as enemies. Immigrants or foreigners, Jesus says to invite them in. Prisoners and criminals, Jesus says to visit them. Those in poverty, Jesus says to help them. Those who have done you wrong, those who have done harm to you or the people that you love, Jesus says to forgive them. Now, I find it interesting that food ministry is common in churches, but prison ministry is quite rare. It's quite rare. I think it shows us that there's more work to be done to be able to better love our neighbors. You know, we know that God's grace extends even to God's enemies. It's at the heart of the gospel that Jesus came to serve and die for the very people who would shout, crucify him, crucify him. We know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead into new life. He overcame all the sin that was thrown at him, even the terrible violence of the cross. We too must remember the gospel as his disciples. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We may experience sin against us as Jesus experienced sin against him. We may not experience the same violence that Jesus did, but there are people who may do us harm and do harm to the people that we love. But we must be as resolute as Jesus, willing to sacrifice even for those folks, willing to serve them, willing to love them. That's what Jesus did. So let's do it too. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Let's love God and love our neighbors. Amen. Amen. change it up a little bit today. I'm going to read a hymn story and Kelly's going to read another hymn story and then you get to sing along with us in your mind <laughs> while we sing the first and the second.
When I Survey the Wondrous Cross is a hymn about the amazing love of Jesus Christ. Here, a hymn story about its origin. It was a daring move when, in 1707, Isaac Watts first published his first book of hymns. At that time, it was the practice of almost every congregation of the Church of England to sing only Old Testament songs in their public worship. However, Watts had grown to dislike this because it restricted the Christian from being able to explicitly celebrate in song all those aspects of the gospel that are fulfilled and illuminated in the New Testament. In the preface to hymns and spiritual songs, Watts addresses the worship situation of his time and offers a defense for writing and publishing new music. I quote, Many ministers and many private Christians have long groaned under this inconvenience and have wished rather than attempted a, re a reformation. At their importunate and repeated requests, I have for some years past devoted many hours of leisure to this service. Far be it from my thoughts to lay aside the Psalms of David in public worship, few can pretend so great a value for them as myself. But it must be acknowledged still that there are a thousand lines in it which were not made for a saint in our day. To assume as his own, there are also many deficiencies of light and glory, which our Lord Jesus and his apostles have supplied in the writings of the New Testament. And with this advantage, I have composed these spiritual songs, which are now presented to the world." Unquote. Within Watt's book, under the section, prepared for the holy ordinance of the Lord's Supper, it is, is the first public printing of When I Survey a Wonder's Cross. Concerning the hymn's creation, there is no special story that singles it from among the many others he wrote. He is credited with something like 750 hymns. But what makes the hymn unique is the particular beauty of its language and imagery and the power with which it highlights the most significant event in human and personal history, the cross of Jesus Christ our God. Watts' giftedness for writing hymns, combined with his courage in publishing them, would eventually turn the tide against singing only psalms and set a new standard for Christian worship in the English language. Today, Watts is widely recognized as the father of English hymnody. When I survey the wondrous cross, is his greatest hymn. As we come to a time of prayer, I do have one name to add to the list that was sent out in our Friday email. We need to pray for Judy Pugh's younger brother, Frank, who is having a heart procedure this week. Would you please pray with me? Dear Lord, we come before you humbled by your greatest commandment to love you and our neighbors as ourselves. It seems like a reasonable, logical request, and yet we fail to obey. We allow our worldly views to skew our understanding, and instead of offering grace, we react in ungodly ways. Encourage us, Lord, to open our hearts to loving even those we blindly deem as unworthy. Fill us with courage to become people who love in service to others. 
Remind us to be fully aware of your love for us, including your forgiveness and acceptance, so that we too can dedicate ourselves to serving others through your light. Lord, we also have many names on our prayer list and in our hearts. We ask for healing, comfort, and mercy. Help us to know that no request is too small. We ask for patience, courage, and perseverance as we sit in prayer, knowing that you hear every request. May we feel grounded in you, knowing that your answers come in many ways, and that it is our trust in you that bears true faith. May those on our list feel your presence as well as our love as they seek your comfort. We especially pray for those too weak to pray, those who feel unworthy of your love, and for those who do not yet know you, Lord. May paths of understanding and peace reach them so that they may be filled with your spirit and find strength. Lord, we also lift up our broken world. May your commandment of loving others fill the deep voids of violence, misunderstanding, political divide, stubbornness, and hatred. Help us to be vehicles of healing right here in our own communities so that we are united to spread your love beyond them. We pray for all of our leaders, religious and political, that they can find new ways of mending the overwhelming number of divides. We pray for all of these things in your son's name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so it's time for some announcements here. Um, I want to first, though, thank you all for your continued giving to the church, your offerings, uh, your tithes. It's just been a boon to our church in the midst of all the difficulties that we're facing. Um, so I encourage you, and uh, I want to just express my gratitude to you uh, for your faithfulness in your giving. Um, you can uh, continue to support our church by going to the website at elktonumc.org. Uh, or there's a PayPal link there on the website as well, or you can send your offerings into the church office. Um, there are offering plates at the entrance of the church as well, so if you would like to place your offering uh, in the offering plate, it, it will be there as you're heading out uh, the building today. Um, our All Saints worship service is coming up next Sunday. It's going to be a very special service, as it always has, has been, and uh, we will have the service at 10 a.m. Um, there will be a special memorial video uh, for church members who have passed away in the past year. Um, we'll also continue that very special flower tradition that we've normally done. Um, if you would like to memorialize a loved one, uh, or loved ones that you have lost uh, in your life. Um, you're welcome to bring a stem flower to the service for, for each person. Um, we'll have the flowers, we'll, we'll also have flowers available to you, so if you forget or if you are unable to get flowers, we'll, we'll have some here for you as well, so you won't be left out. Um, we'll uh, also have that special time of reflection in the service where, where, where you will be able to come forward and put your flower in a vase. So it will be a, a service of reflection, uh, a service to grieve, but also a service uh, to celebrate resurrection and new life and to proclaim the good news of the gospel 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too will be raised into glory and be reunited with our loved ones. So I encourage you to be there next week for our All Saints service. Um, the, church servi- uh, the church service, the church office will be open every day this week from 9 a.m. to noontime, Monday through Friday. Um, I also continue to do a midweek Bible reflection, so tune in at noontime on Wednesdays, and I'll be doing a reflection on a particular passage in the Bible. Uh, that, the video from that reflection will be also uploaded to YouTube and Facebook. Um, virtual Sunday School for all ages is available. You can watch the videos which are uploaded to Facebook and YouTube. I uh, looked, and it's already been uploaded this morning. Um, They're so much fun, and we have so many uh, wonderful church members who are participating, and all of you would enjoy them whether you're older or you're younger. So tune in to those as well and support our Sunday school class. Um, Our church is offering Zoom accounts for any church groups uh, who would like to meet virtually. If you would like to schedule a Zoom meeting, you can just call the church office, and uh, Beth, who is just so wonderful, would be happy very, very happy to schedule a Zoom meeting for you. Uh, the Wednesday night communion service continues. It's every other Wednesday. It's going to be moved to the chapel. So the chapel at 6.15 p.m. on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday. The next one coming up will be held on November 4th, November 4th. Also today, you can pick up your boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Um, uh, Remember to pick up a brochure when, if you go down to the table. The, the table for the Operation Christmas Child is down in the hospitality area. Um, if you pick up one of those boxes, make sure you grab a brochure that'll help you and uh, remind you of the things that go in the box. Um, please fill those shoe boxes and bring them back with you by November 8th, if at all possible. The latest possible date uh, to bring them uh, back to the church is November the 15th. You can also use one of your shoeboxes from home if you would prefer. Um, For those of you who are worshiping virtually, this coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, those shoeboxes will be made available to you. Um, Another opportunity to show your generosity is that we are participating in our annual Harvest Festival food drive uh, for Immaculate Conception's food ministry. And you can pick up your bags today Uh, from multiple places around the church. I see some of you have those bags. Uh, So please return uh, those bags filled up uh, by November the 8th. Again, bags will be available uh, for those who are worshiping virtually uh, when you pick up your communion elements this week on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 a.m. to noontime. Uh, The Scouts, they have a wreath sale that's going on that I want to make you aware of. You can find the order form on our website at uh, elktonumc.org. You can click the scrolling news marquee that's right in the middle, uh, or you can click on the events, the news and events tab at the top of the page, and then just scroll down, and and you'll see uh, the Troop 443 fundraiser, uh, and the link to the order form will be there too. So please support our scouts. They need your support. It's been a difficult season for them to raise money this year. Um, Well, that's all the announcements I have for you today. Um, So I invite you to listen uh, to another beautiful hymn story.
Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus was composed in the aftermath of the untimely death of the author's beloved friend. In the spring of 1858, revival was taking place in Philadelphia. The movement grew out of midday prayer meetings coordinated by the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA. Reverend Dudley A. Tang, a young Episcopalian minister, soon came to be recognized as its leader. Though there was some controversy over his anti-slavery preaching, Ting was known and loved for his zeal for the work of God. Among the interdenominational leaders who gathered around him was the Presbyterian minister, George Duffield, Jr. On Tuesday, April 13, 1858, Reverend Ting was studying at his count, uh, country home when he went to the barn to check on his mule, which was driving the machine that shelled corn. As he patted down the animal, the sleeve of his gown got caught in the cogs of the machine. His arm was severely injured. Though the arm was soon amputated, the wound became mortal, and Ting died the following week. Before he died, however, he was asked by friends if there were any messages he would have, he would have them give to those who had participated with him in the revival work. Ting responded briefly, beginning with the words, Tell them, let us all stand up for Jesus. In the days and events following Ting's death, these final words were invoked several times and became a resounding exhortation to all who had been affected by his ministry. When George Duffield Jr. preached to his own congregation the next week, he focused on Ephesians 6.14, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, and concluded his sermon with a hymn he had written. It began with the line, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The hymn was soon picked up by Presbyterian and Congregationalist publishers, and it quickly became an established work. Similar to Onward Christian Soldiers, it became popular among soldiers of the Civil War, most likely because of its militaristic imagery and language. But as we noted with that hymn, the connection to worldly battles was not the author's intent. Christians have often sung soldier songs because, as God tells us in Ephesians 6 and elsewhere, our lives in Christ are a fight for faith in the midst of spiritual enemies. We are called to stand in the strength he supplies. Praise God, and stand up, stand up for Jesus. But now also receive the benediction. Go in peace with joy to serve the Lord. Offer love to your neighbors and all people as you are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.